Thank you. While Rowan is setting the slides up for me, I would like to thank Matta for the kind invitation to come to this beautiful city of Dublin and Matta Private for their sponsorship. They not only invited me, they even set up a, a, a very nice weather for us, so that was a very pleasant flight for us. But Dublin is not new for me. I had my first fellowship in 1986. I'm a fellow of the College of Surgeons. Rowan may or may not know that. <coughs> Expect to know less. <laughs> and I'm very proud of that. But uh, what I want to talk about is the different aspect of what you have heard so far. So the, Brian has talked about advanced tumors, and then um, Rowan has talked about how the surgery is changing, evolving. And then I'm gonna talk about the early stage tumors and what we should do about this. But it's important that whatever we're doing when we talk about cancer, people concentrate on the cancer as such, but nobody thinks about the patient, where the cancer is within it, what the patient feels about having all this, what the patient don't feel about having this, whether they accept the risk of recurrence as opposed to major surgery or having chemo radiation or major uh, uh, treatment with uh, chemo, very toxic chemotherapy. So do patients have a choice is the, uh, the title of my talk. I am not against surgery and surgery is still the standard of care in treatment of rectal cancer. But we're seeing a lot of early stage rectal cancers now through National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. But we shouldn't really treat the same standard of care that we do for advanced tumors, for these early tumors. This is the, my message. We need to personalize the treatment. And why, <laughs> can you hear me from the back? Because I'm away from the mic actually. Um, why do we need to personalize this? There are several reasons. One of that is the aging population, not just in UK, in, in Europe and around the world, you see that. And there's recognition of harm from surgery, especially in the elderly, and I'll show you some data on that. But more important is the early stage cancers are being increasingly diagnosed through National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. I don't know whether you have bowel cancer screening in, in, in Ireland, and you will be seeing a lot of early tumors. So because the disease stage is changing, we shouldn't have the same concept of how we treat for these early tumors as opposed to advanced stage tumors. <coughs> this is one of the data from the UK statistics. And 85 plus, <clears throat> nearly 3 million, that will double in 20 years' time. And for these patients who are elderly, when they are faced with uh, rectal cancer, what do you do about that? Because the, the harm from surgery, this is the data from NPOGAP. For 80 plus, the 30-day mortality is 14%. For 90 plus, it's 25%. And that's reflected in the Dutch data, which has shown exactly the same figures. For 90 plus, this is a very small slide actually, um, the, the figure is 25%. That's a 30-day mortality. What the Dutch group has done is they look at six months. And by six months, that figure is doubled to nearly 50%. So nearly half the patients are dead after be, having major surgery. So you've got to think of what harm you're doing to these patients. This is a thousand patient slides where you can see all these reds are patients who died. All the yellows are patients that have been harmed by these major surgery. And these little blue are the ones that you cured. To achieve that cure, you, you're doing a lot of harm for these. This is the data from National Bowel Cancer Screening Program started in UK in 2006 and rolled out in 2009. And the prediction was that half of the bowel 
cancers being through the screening, we're going to see early stage tumors. And out of that, a quarter will be polyp cancers, very, very early stage. And the figure for that is in UK, we see about 12,000 new rectal cases a year, 9,000 get uh, had surgery of some sort, and majority of these get major surgery. Only 11% has got um, local excision or local treatment. And out of those patients, I'm the biggest center in UK treating uh, contact radiation. We only treat about 100 patients a year. So in that context, you know, we are over treating a lot of these early stage tumors. This is not a dream. It is a reality because this is the data from the Northwest group. Professor Otu shared this slide with me. And this is the data from two years ago. And we're seeing a lot of early stage tumors now. And what do, how do we treat these early stage tumors? Are we going to treat the same as what we were doing many years ago? Or are we going to change the strategy? And this is the philosophy that I'm trying to instill to my colleagues. If you look at rectal cancer, you can divide them into the good, the bad, and the ugly. So the ugly ones are the ones that uh, Brian has alluded to, where these are T3Cs, meaning that it's gone through more than five millimeter, 10 millimeter, and so on. And then T4s, when they're attached to nearby structures, a lot of lymph nodes, the tumor size is usually bigger than three centimeter. <coughs> usually if you do a MRI scan, you'll see that the tumor is involving the circumferential resection margin. And for these ugly tumors, there's no question we should be doing chemo radiation or chemo as elegantly uh, as uh, Brian has uh, alluded about various trials, and then downstage them, and then do operation. And these, this is a, this, there's no, no argument about this strategy for that. Nobody at present around the world will offer radiation to very early stage small tumors. And this is the area that is my interest. The middle group is again, Brian has showed elegant uh, trials about the CRO7. I'm one of the authors on that, where we get a short course radiation and then you have surgery on that. But the type of patients that I want to concentrate on is this early group, T1, T2, T3A, meaning going out by just one millimeter, just out by one millimeter of the bowel wall. And these are the good groups. And NICE has now agreed that these are low risk groups. There shouldn't be any suspicious lymph nodes. The tumor size should be less than three centimeter. And these are usually mobile polyps that we see. And the type of surgery that we talked about and the, that we offered, it's not suitable for everyone. The patient may not be agreeable for this type of surgery. And so what are the alternatives? The alternative I want to propose is contact radiation, which is also called papillon. When you say papillon, everybody says, oh, it's a butterfly. So in French, but papillon is butterfly, but we're not talking about a butterfly. We're talking about Professor Jean-Pierre Jean-Paul Papillon, who was in Lyon, and he passed away in 1993. Our team from Clatter Bridge visited Lyon in 1992. And when I was appointed consultant many years ago, my medical director then, Professor Seeley said, what do you want to do, Sonny? So I said to him, I'd like to go and see Professor Papillon in Lyon. And he said, why do you want to see him? So I said, I don't really believe that you can cure rectal cancer with radiation. So he laughs and he said, yes, you can do that, Sonny. You can cure it. So I said, I don't believe it. So he said, I've seen it. So I said, I haven't seen it. I want to see it. So he picked the phone up and rang Papillon, who's his friend. And Papillon said, oh, send your fellow over. We'll teach him how to do it. So Ross Healy said, Sonny, you take the whole team with you, radiographer, physicist with you, and you introduce the technology back to UK because we don't have this facility. So not knowing what I'm taking on, 
I said yes because I wanted to go and go to Leon. I was there in Leon for only two weeks, but Papillon was nearly 80, and he said, I don't do much clinical work now. You go and see Jean-Pierre Gerard, who is my protege. And I went to see Jean-Pierre Gerard, who I still work with, and i just seen him a few, few days ago, actually. He came up to Clatterbridge. And Jean-Pierre Gerard, the first thing he said was, do you know how to scope a patient? So I said, because I was surgically trained, and don't forget, I've got a fellowship from Dublin College of Surgeons, I said, yes, I know how to scope. And he said, yes, that's fine. If you can scope, you can do papillon. That's no problem. So I was able to see a lot of patients that he <coughs> treated over the years and months in the morning. And then he treated the patients in the afternoons. So I was there for just a fortnight. And we came back and we started to set up a system. But we don't have all those machines at that time. So we were using the machine that we treat for the skin tumors with the Therapex machines. And that's how we started over these years. We've now got a new machine made by a British company called Ariane, and we have to try and select the patient because we've now treated over 1,000 patients. And the, the type of patients that we would like to treat are patients who are not suitable for surgery, so in other words, elderly patients, who are, some of them are quite fit, and they could have surgery if they want to, and some young ones or the old ones who refuse surgery. So these are early rectal cancers, either T1 or T2 on the scan, <coughs> or T3C is just going up by one millimeter, tumor confined to the bowel wall. So these are the ones that we're concentrating on. Small tumors, less than three centimeter, in other words, they're occupying, if you look at the, down the, the, the scope, a third of the circumference. Histologically, they have to be well to moderately well differentiated tumors. And when you feed it with your finger, they are freely mobile tumors. We can treat up to 12 centimeters, so we're treating lower and middle, almost to the uh, upper third we can reach. But obviously, we now stage them very accurately with MRI scans. And then you can do intraanal ultrasound if you've got a facility. We don't always do that on all patients because I get patients from all over the country. So some centers do that, most don't. But what we're trying to do is to avoid patients with suspicious lymph nodes. So this is the sort of appearance you see on the MRI. This is the appearance you see on the endoscopy. We don't want to treat all the rectal cancer patients. There are some who are not suitable and these are the poorly differentiated adenocarcinoma. Glad to say that not very many uh, patients have poorly differentiated tumor. They're less than 10%. Those with lymphovascular invasion, obviously we don't want to treat because they're the high risk patient for recurrence. And if there are suspicious lymph nodes, so again, there's a lot of debate. What do you mean by suspicious lymph nodes? So you don't have to be a clever radiologist. If you look at this, this is a horrible looking tumor that has gone out. You can see the lymphovascular invasion there. And you can see these nodules, which are clearly visible. And these are obviously suspicious because irregular margin, inhomogeneity, and so on. And then you can see a node like that. If there are any suspicious nodes like that, we tend not to treat these for radical treatment. But of course, if they are not fit for surgery, we can treat them as a palliative patient. And then when there's a carpet of tumors, so in other words, lateral spreading tumors, more than half the circumference, these are not suitable for contact radiation. How it works, this is a cartoon done by Professor Papillon. This is a Philip machine. There's a polyp in the rectum. You insert the instrument through the anus, natural orospris. And you apply a very high dose of radiation, but using a very low energy X-ray, which is 50 kV. In other words, it's like a dental X-ray that, that we get. Applying a very high <laughs> dose of radiation, 30 gray. This is a physical dose of 30 gray. Radiobiologically, because it's a low energy X-ray, they are equivalent to about 100 gray of the external beam. So two and a half times more than external beam we normally use about 45 gray and 25 fraction. So each 30 gray is equivalent to two and a half times the normal course of external radiation. And we use every two weeks, 
another 30 degree, two weeks later, another 30 degree, total of 90 degree, which is equivalent to about 300 centigree of external beam. There's no way you can apply 300 centigree of uh, external beam uh, with using the external beam radiation. We get away because we're treating a very small volume, 5 cc. If you imagine an external beam, you showed some pictures, Brian has showed some pictures of external beam radiation. They are usually about a liter, a liter and a half cc. But we're treating a volume of 5 cc, which is very tiny. But most important, it's targeted straight on the tumor, so you don't get the collateral damage with that. And then because you're doing it every two weeks, the normal tissues are recovering. <coughs> if you concentrate on this left-hand slide, which is the appearance of a malignant polyp seen through the endoscope, after one shot of contact radiation, it shrinks down very nicely. And you can see a normal mucosa around it. But most important is the shrinkage is such that it's not just in one direction, it shrinks down in all directions, including the roots that are infiltrating into the muscle moved up. This is a 30 millimeter diameter, which is the largest that we can use. This diameter is 25 millimeter. And you can see this, the volume of shrinkage after one shot of 30 gray. After the second shot, the tumor disappeared completely. You can't actually see anything. You can't feel anything. If you do an MRI, you can't see anything. And you've seen that. And these are what we call good responders, no residual tumor and complete response. Brian touched on that, complete clinical response. But this is achieving complete response with 50 gray or maybe 55 gray maximum. We're talking about 300 centigrade and the response has to be sustained. And if they are sustained, we just adopt what we call watch and wait policy. If there is a residual abnormality, we can do transanal resection like Rowan has shown. There are a proportion of patients which does not respond to this high dose of radiation and that about 20 to 25% do not respond to this high dose of radiation. And if there's a bulky residual disease that is left that you can see, that you can feel or on the MRI, they go for total mesorectal excision with the techniques that Rohan has described. But at the present time, we have no useful molecular markers to predict who's going to respond well, who's not going to respond well. And again, the, the trials that uh, Brian has eluded is going to give us some insight into this type of response that you can expect. And if we know upfront, we won't be wasting time on <coughs> giving them radiation. We go straight for surgery. If we know that they're going to be sensitive, we don't be wasting time doing planning surgery. We go straight for this type of radiation. At the moment, that is still experimental. Of course, there are side effects. So after a course of radiation, you will see a little superficial ulcer like that. This is fairly flat. When you touch it, it's quite soft. It's important not to biopsy that lesion because there is no suspicion of residual tumor. And then again, Brian has alluded that biopsies on these is non, the positive predictive value is very, very poor because most of the time, the nest of tumor cell that is left is underneath. It's no use getting biopsies from the mucosa because there's no mucosa lesion. All that is is beneath the mucosa, and that's where the papillon is effective. That's where you can hit it hard with radiation with the nest of tumor cells beneath the mucosa. And that also normally heals within three to six months if there is no residual tumor. But obviously, if there is any residual tumor at the back, it starts to grow within that period. So you get that in about a third of patients, but usually it heals. There is bleeding in about 30% of cases. And the reason why it bleeds is you, you get a scar like that. This is a papillon scar. You have a crown of telangiectasia <coughs> around that. And people who are on warfarin, aspirin, or clopidogrel, and a lot of these old people, as you can imagine, what atrial fibrillation, they have GIAs, they have various 
comorbidities, and they are on one thing or the other, and they tend to bleed more. And in our experience, about 10% of these cases needed argon beam to treat, and 90% don't. But they do bleed, but then the bleeding is not severe. Those who are severe, those who are on these anticoagulants, we can treat them with argon beam. And that's the most uh, serious side effects from this. This is a world series where Papillon himself has treated over 300 patients, and he got a local control of over 90%. Professor Jarat has treated, this is an old slide, he's treated nearly 400 patients now, more than Papillon himself, and he's validated Papillon results. Professor Sishi is a gentleman from the United States. Like me, he visited Papillon in the early 70s. He introduced Papillon into the United States, and he treated over 200 patients. I work closely with Bob Marsin, who is a professor in Washington University. Until he retired last year, he was still in touch and write uh, papers together. And he's treated over 200 patients now. This is my series when I was publishing in 2007. We've treated now more than 1,000 patients. But these different countries, different centers validated the local control of Papillon with different uh, group of cohort of patients. Now we have an international group who've got all these machines, and this is an international cohort of patients where a small malignant polyp will be excised and then resection margins involved or close, or when turned out to be a T2 tumor instead of T1, then the patient's not suitable for major surgery or patient refusing major surgery because it involves a stoma. This is the cohort of patients that we treated around. Our center, Nice, Hull is the second center in UK who's been doing it for the last five years. We've now got Guildford in Nottingham, which has been doing it for the last two years. Brian may remember the girl called uh, Alex Stewart, who was in, in, in Marston when you were around that time. And then these are the, the, the French centers. So we've, we've, for these early tumors where they, we've excised them initially with TAMS or EMR or whatever, turned out to be malignant, either T1 or T2, patient refusing surgery or not fit for surgery. This is the data. Local recurrence for these is 3%. Now, there's another group of more advanced tumors, again, the same cohort, and these are called CONTEM trials. And these are observational studies. And this is our group from 2009 to 2012. We've now got about 250 patients. You've got a lot more local recurrences because they are more advanced tumors, T233, and the size is up to about five centimeters. The, the slide, previous slide, the tumor size is less than two centimeters. <coughs> so you've got more local recurrences, but if you follow them up closely, you'll be able to salvage them. And by salvaging, uh, the organ preservation in this group is quite high in, in the region of about 80%. We're writing this paper up, and that should be published soon. We talk of MDTs, and we're going to sit in the MDT tomorrow in your MDT, and hopefully we'll see this. But the drawback of MDT is you don't see the patient. Most of the time, you see the MRIs. You sometimes see endoscopic appearances. But whatever you decide, the patient is not involved in your decision. So what we have to do is to go down and see a patient after doing the MDD discussion, and then relay the discussion, and then see whether the patient agrees or not. But in that, we have to consider the age of the patient. Some of them are quite elderly, and the oldest I've treated is 104. The performance status, although they may be 50 or 60, they may look like 80 or 90, and there are a lot of people who are drinkers and smokers, and all sorts of things that they do. The age, more biologically, and their performance status will be quite poor. And if you offer them major surgery, the risk of complication and death is very high. And a lot of these old people have got these comorbidities, which I've alluded. And for this lady, she's got crippled rheumatoid arthritis. And how can she cope with the stoma back? There's no way she can cope. The surgeon who was treating her would say, oh, we will teach a nurse to, 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 to tell her how to cope it. 
And my husband said, no, I can't. You can't teach. She, she's, she can't do this. She can't do this stoma back at all. And he said, there must be a w other way around it. And he said, no. So he sent it to an oncologist to see. And unfortunately, the oncologist never heard of Papillon. So I'm very glad to say that this patient who, was, who, was treat who came from Guildford, they've now got the machine and treating a lot of patients like these in Guildford now. This patient I treated came up to Liverpool and treated her five years ago. She's alive, fit and well without any stoma. There are a lot of patients who will rather die than have a stoma and I've seen it and I'm sure you all have come across these sort of patients. <coughs> this is one such patient who was 80 at the time of diagnosis. I'll come back to his picture in a minute. When he was diagnosed, this is the MRI scan appearance of this tumor, which looks horrible inside, obviously presented with bleeding when they scope and find this thing, biopsy, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, staging MRI. It was a very low tumor, so our practice is to offer them chemo radiation because he's quite a fit man. And then now we do the post-treatment MRIs routinely mandated to, to do that. And if you look at these two, the tumor that you can see has disappeared completely. So the radiologist said, well, I can't see any tumor now. So the surgeon said, okay, I'll go down. He's coming today. I'm going to offer him some surgery. Went down and talked to the patients and said that you're going to have surgery next week. And the patient said, no, I'm going skiing. I don't want the surgery. So he, he wasn't sure, so he scratched his head. He rang me, Sonny, this old chap, you know, that we've just discussed, he doesn't want surgery. He's mad and he's going skiing. So I said, have you scoped him? And he said, no, I haven't scoped him. So just wait, I'll come and we'll scope him together. So I went across, because we we're doing a parallel clinic. I went across and when we scoped, there was hardly anything to see. <coughs> it has disappeared. But when you feel it, you can s still feel a bit of induration there. So I said to him, you go skiing, I'll do the papillon when you come back in two weeks time. So he was happy, came back and I did the papillon three shots. He's now 85 and he's still skiing. <coughs> he went skiing twice a year and he's very happy. Now what does all this mean? If you see a good response, this is a data from Mercury that uh, Mercury Group have published in GCO about five years ago. When you see a good downstaging on MRI, when you see poor downstaging on MRI, regression of the tumor, it's, it's reflected in disease-free survival. But all, all these patients end up having surgery, most of them, except a few who refuse surgery. You see complete pathological response. When you see that, and there's residual tumor left, it's reflected in disease-free survival. So there's something in it. This is what Brian was talking about. We're trying to predict what's happening without doing an operation. But most of the time, we already <coughs> have the data who respond well, who don't respond well. But what does PCR mean? We don't really know yet. But a lot of data is coming through saying that where there's very little or no residual tumor, these patients do very well indeed. And this is what we're trying to do without doing major surgery. So this is the data that Brian has shown earlier, Brazilian group. They were the first in the, uh, she herself, by the way, is a surgeon. She's a professor of surgery. And most of the patients that she treat get surgery, don't get me wrong. They get chemo radiation. And when there is a complete clinical response, she, she don't operate on all of them. And what they do is to watch it carefully. And then they change the dose and fractionation. They were doing 45 grain, 25 fractions initially. Then they moved it up to 54 grain now and give additional chemo. And what she's achieving is almost half these patients are achieving what we call a complete clinical response in inverted coma. She was very happy, but there was tumor regrowth of 31% within the first two years. And most of these can be salvaged over 90% can be salvaged, and she was happy with that. 
At the end of the day, the organ preservation was less than 40%. This is the data from Danish group where they give 54 gray. On top of that, they got a brachytherapy boost of 10 gray, so they got 64 gray, quite a high dose. By doing that, you get much higher complete clinical response. But again, in the paper which came out, these, these are all the references, by the way, there's a regrowth of nearly a quarter of these. This is Andrew Reinhardt paper. I'm one of the authors on that. And that came out in Lancet Oncology last December. This is a, a, the UK biz, biggest group, and world biggest group, actually. 129 patient watch and wait compared to 129 who had surgery. And again, in that paper, what we found was nearly half of these uh, initial complete response. But a lot of them, there's a regrowth of the tumor. When we do this being written up, and hopefully we will we'll be able to publish that shortly, our response rates are nearly 70%. As I said to you, some of them, no matter how high dose you give, they don't respond. About this 70% is much higher than any of these. Even the one who were giving 64 gray, we get a lot more higher complete responses. But the difference is our regrowth rate is less than 10%, or around 11%. So the regrowth rates are reduced much further down by doing contact radiation. And this is the data from the Danish group. They were looking at it. They gave 64 gray, and why does the patient's tumor regrow? And they worked out the dose response against, against the response against the dose. And what they found was you need to give at least 90 gray to sterilize half the tumor. Well, there's no way you can give external beam 90 gray. It's like giving a prostate brachytherapy. There's no way you can give 90 gray to, to using external beam to rectum. And we give 30, 30, 30, 90 gray, which is much higher biological dose, up on top of the 45 gray. So that we, they, they all get more than 100 gray. But in radiobiological terms, that is three times that dose. This is the reason why we get such high dose of sterilization. But we could try and prove it. So we're trying to set up a trial called OPERA. It's a T2, T3, T3B tumor with N1 lymph nodes less than five centimeter, mid to low rectal tumors. The endpoint is organ preservation. So we would start off with external beam radiation at randomization, 45 gray and 25 fraction. And one arm will get additional nine gray boost, so 54 gray. The experimental, experimental arm will get papillon boost of 90 gray. And we look at the, who achieve a complete response, who achieve a partial response, who can be treated with 10. No response will go straight for surgery. And we will compare these two arms. Our hypothesis is there would be at least 20% difference. So they started in France now. They got the full funding of half a million, and they've treated 12 patients so far. We're hoping to get some funding from the UK, and hopefully we'll be able to join in. The OPERA trial sits in, in the NCRI portfolio between the good and the bad, which I've showed you earlier in my slides. So we have the track trial for the good ones. We've now got Star Trek, which competes a little bit with Opera. But Star Trek randomized between radical surgery and experimental arm. And they can't really do a phase one or phase three study. They're looking at the feasibility of whether they can recruit enough patients or not. That's how they, they, they are at that stage. Opera has already started recruiting 12 patients now. We have the Aristotle, which Brian has alluded about, and we've recruited quite well for the very advanced early stage tumors. Copernicus and Bacchus use the principle of neoadjuvant chemo, followed by surgery. Copernicus will have a short course in it, and they're still uh, recruiting at the moment. It's important 
to think outside the box because of our training, the governance issue, the guidelines and the protocols, we're getting bound the way we think. But you need to be aware of the new innovation <coughs> terms that Joan has showed us, Papillon, which I've just showed you. A new concept of treatment, which is minimal invasion, less harm. But most important is the change in disease stage. So when you're seeing a lot of early stage tumor, you shouldn't be thinking or treating like you would treat very advanced stage tumors. Professor Bill Hill, some of you will know, I'm sure Rohan uh, is aware of this. He goes around the world telling everybody that you don't need surgery for rectal cancer, you can all treat it with surgery. But now he started thinking about it. And then there was a meeting called when not, were you there at the uh, uh, Lisbon? So that was in 2014, he invited about 300 surgeons around the colorectal surgeons around the world. And there was a different way of thinking. Habagama was there and he was trying to introduce the concept of um, a complete clinical response watch and wait strategy. We have a second meeting in Milan. The third one was in Beijing too. And I don't know when the next one will be. But they've written a, a, a leader in the colorectal disease to say that those who achieve a complete response we should give patients a choice of whether they would go for watch and wait or go for surgery. And there's a new way of thinking, the new thinking among the surgeons. Fortunately for, for us, NICE has now produced the guidance on the contact radiation after so many years. And in that, they say that patients in whom the surgery is not considered suitable, the toxicity and the efficacy is sufficient from the evidence they have so far. They look at a thousand patients. A lot of the series that I showed earlier were the evidence for NICE. But they realize that in patients who are fit for surgery but refuse surgery, and there are quite a few of these coming around now, we need to do a proper informed consent. And we should do audit on these and then do a research which we're doing with the OPERA trial. <coughs> but now this new guidelines for NICE has come out, it's supposed to come out in December, but it was published in February. And now they have got the non-surgical option in the new NICE guidelines for rectal cancer. And if you click on the non-surgical option, you can see that contact X-ray brachytherapy. So it's now NICE has approved it. They didn't actually say who should have it or who shouldn't have it. It was in their main guidelines now, which does help. But in their main guidelines, what they said was, you should, the patient should have the opportunity to make the informed decision about their care and treatment in partnership with the healthcare professionals. So the type of patient I'm proposing group of patients that we would like to treat is a low risk early stage tumors in low rectum, T1, T2, or T3, small mobile tumors, which we're seeing more and more through National Bowel Cancer Screening Program. Elderly patients, I've shown you the slides of how the aging population with a lot of 85 plus going to be 6 million in 10 years time. But younger patients with high surgical risk or who are not keen on having major surgery, we must not have any suspicious lymph nodes. We discuss all these in the MDT and offer patients the treatment options after the MDT, like I've showed you with this chap who wants to go skiing. This is our website. If you look into the website and look, click on the professional and Papillon training course, you'll be able to see some of the data that we've shown. So just as a, 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 a recap, malignant care pathway, what I would like to propose is for these low rectal tumors, early stage, small tumors, you discuss them at the MDT. Upfront, if they want to go for surgery, you go, you, sur you, you offer them surgery, either TME or TEMS, like Rohan has shown. And then you come and do papillon if need be. I'll come back to this. But if they go for the non-surgical option for the small tumors, T1 and T2s, you can start off with <coughs> contact radiation and then add external beam. With the T2, there's a risk of lymph node 
but that's the situation which you can't see on the scans. And if they have chief for complete response, we do a watch and wait. If there's no response, we go for surgery, no harm done. Partial response, you can have TAMS. But for much bigger tumors or more advanced tumors, you start off with external beam because the largest applicator that we can do is three millimeter. So bigger tumors, you try to downstage, downsize it like I showed you, and then use a contact boost to improve local control. Because if you just use external beam chemo radiation, there's 30% risk of regrowth. So to try and reduce that regrowth, we do the contact boost. And then if they achieve a complete response, watch and wait, no response, surgery, tense. So that's the way I would propose. And this is what we're trying to test in the OPERA trial. We do prefer to do TAMS upfront if there's no proof of malignancy in the polyp. So rather than do repeated biopsies, we'd rather go for TAMS to get a full thickness like Rowan has shown elegantly. If the patient doesn't want to hang around waiting for years on end, when the tumor is going to come back, they said, go for surgery, I don't want to hang around wait. Or surgeon may say, oh, this is tamable, we should go for it. If there's a residual mucos mucosal abnormality after papillon, I would suggest doing TAMS. And this is one patient, he's mid, uh, uh, late 50 patient with a big tumor. After chemo radiation, he was downstage. And then he had papillon. And then a year later, there was a little regrowth there. And the surgeon from Bangor, said, oh, Sonny, there's a re re recurrence. We must go for a completion surgery. Patient wasn't very keen, so he came back to me. And when I actually looked at it, it was a small uh, nodule there, which was quite soft and doesn't feel malignant to me. So I said to him, well, I think we should just remove that area and see what happens. So he had 10 surgery, and then that area was sutured. And you've seen the video that uh, Rohan has shown. And the histology came back as adenomas. So this is where we have the multimodality approach in trying to treat the patient. We avoided major surgery on this because we were able to do TAMS. We would like to do papillon in preference to TAMS in patients who are not fit for GA. For, for, <coughs> for TAMS, you do need GA. So you would do TAMS on GA? Would you do TAMS without GA or? We haven't, but I mean, it's, it's possible, isn't it? Yeah, but most surgeons that I ask, you know, um, would say uh, they, they, they wouldn't, except John Monson, actually, who's now gone to Rochester. They, they, all the others said, no, no, we have to do it. But anyway, most patients would need GA. So patients who are not fit for GA, then you should try with papillon. Large malignant ulcerated polyp, very low rectal malignant polyp, just on the dentate line, then those are the ones we would try to treat. Because if you do GEMS, they get a lot of pain and incontinence or high anterior malignant polyp. If there is any residual tumor after papillon, you can do salvage, like I've shown earlier. Indication for papillons after TAM, this is our first group, T1, T2, uh, T1, T2, very small tumors. Elderly patients who are not fit for completion surgery, we've now got nice guidance now, or younger patients who refuse surgery because that involves a major surgery. Then if the TAM scar is less than a millimeter, or there is an unexpected T2 polyp on what we thought was a T1, or there's extra neural venous evasion, the patient's not keen on having major surgery, then we've got the data to show in our 180 patients, there's only 3% local recurrence. We've now got four centers. This is a dear old lady in a 92. How center, the surgeon, doesn't want to operate on this 92-year-old, my colleague Amandara, said a short course, so they had a short course, she had a short course, and there was still a residual tumor there. And they, it was the first patient that they treated five years ago. So she survived for a few years without a recurrence, but she passed away, she was 95 when she died. So these are the four centers here, and these are the centers raring to start. And I hope we'll be able to persuade you to start this facility in Dublin in a not too distant future. So when you see responses like that, <coughs> just remarkable, but for a patient, the bleeding stop, the pain stop, discharge stop, and they can move their bowels normally. And if you can get that, why do you want to do major surgery or give them
chemo and all these toxic treatments. So we've got to try and respect the patient's choices, like that deformed arthritic lady, or the young guy who's refusing surgery. It's a benefit what you get in terms of cure, but you shouldn't just go for cure at any cost, because a lot of people are prepared to accept higher recurrence rate, knowing that they can be salvaged. It's not just a survival, it's the quality of survival if, you, if they are incontinent and having a lot of um, leakages, the last call that we do for low anterior section, if they are dribbling all the time with poor quality, it's no use being curing this patient against the recurrence and death and complications which I have alluded. So finally, you avoid major surgery in elderly patients with early rectal cancer, please consider Papillon. Consider contact radiation boost in patients who achieve a complete response after chemo radiation, because if you just leave it, there's a 30% chance of regrowth. So if you want to try and reduce it, you, you give contact radiation boost. And pa most patients, if you ask them, they prefer to avoid surgery and stoma if they can help it. For these early stage tumors, I think you should try and avoid that. Just remember this elderly patient skiing. My whole talk, if you can just remember that in future, that would be beneficial in thinking about patients' choices in the future. I thank you for your attention.